So again, what we're doing is uh, I'm introducing uh, some special guests, some pot of court. Uh, Michael Bowman is on with us right now. He's the president. Um, Michael can be reached at uh, this location, and if you need some more information from Michael, all you have to do is email me uh, at pre-sales at open-e.com, and I'll get you Michael's information. Also, along with uh, Michael is Mark Brown. They do a lot of business together, and Mark specializes in data centers. So I brought both of the worlds here for everyone uh, to help us understand about the cloud and how it all ties in. So where some pot of is really valued here is that they specialize in the cloud storage and they've been for quite some time now. And uh, Mark has uh, both of them been using our products for a while and we thought it would be kind of interesting to bring them in. So on the next slide what we'll do is we'll go ahead and uh, bring Michael in and uh, actually and actually let Michael, you might want to let Mark talk about this, especially some of the events, uh, if we talk about this correctly, Michael, uh, and I'll let you do the intros and then uh, maybe have Mark tell about what happens when clouds fail or cascading uh, tears when they all fail in the cloud. So at this point, I'm going to turn right. it over to uh, these guys and let them go right here. So if there's a sound problem, let me know. Thank you, Todd. Yes, I have um, with me, this is Michael, Mark Brown, and uh, Mark and I discussed some of the uh, architecture that's being used by companies such as Amazon, Rackspace, competitors of ours. And Mark Mark has a, um, a description of what, what happened with the Amazon failure a couple of months ago. Mark? Well, I'm going to show you the world. The way Amazon's data centers are structured, um, they're divided into pods. And uh, in the case of the Virginia failure, these pods are not set on each other. So if one pod were to fail and take out um, all cells and virtual machines in their, in their uh, adaptable cloud storage, um, theoretically the rest of the data center would be unaffected and the redundant storage would be unaffected. Um, however, in the case of Virginia, that did not happen. What happened is pod one failed. Uh, it took out pod two, which took out pod three, and um, basically that's a, a cascade failure until the entire data center went offline. Um, probably the two most serious port parts of the, the failure at Amazon were, one, it took a couple of days for them to get everything back up and running because everything was so heavy reliant on, on everything else. Um, quite frankly, is to this day, Amazon has still lost a significant amount of data for customers. Um, Amazon storage is uh, is proprietary to them, the software. Um, they're the only ones that have any experience with it. Um, so basically, if they can't get the data back, no one can. That's pretty much what the event was on. Um, and Although it has not been repeated, as an engineer, I could say that if it's happened once, it could more than likely happen again. Uh, Todd, you want to flip to the next slide? Thanks, Mark. Uh, we'll flip to the next slide, so we'll go right there. If there's any questions, uh, everybody, you can go ahead and ask some questions on the chat window. All right, we're going to go to the next slide. And I think this will be uh, yours, um, Michael. Go ahead. Todd, let's see. I don't have that slide up here. Uh, yes, thank you, Todd. Yeah, what Mark, Mark, Todd's got a description of cloud storage, a way of, of storing data for uh, you as a, as a customer. From our perspective, we define Cloud, uh, cloud computing as providing the computer power to you as a service. And in the case of virtualizing and hosting the OpenE DSS v6, which is storage, we provide storage as a service to you. So provisioning and providing what is needed by the customer is how we define cloud. It's particularly cloud storage. Yeah, sure. Yes, you want me to thank you, Todd. If you can flip it to the next slide, we can talk a little bit about about costs. Sure. We'll go ahead right to the next section. Yes, you 
you can put two slides ahead, Todd, and I can start talking here. If you guys uh, have done any online searches about the cost of of storage in the cloud bytes per month, um, <clears throat> turning to uh, two. Turn yeah, you can flip to the next one. To us as a service provider, you might expect us to have which would be the hardware cost for us to the virtual appliance, which is DSS v6, um, back, back one slide, and the hardware cost for the actual storage volumes themselves in the cloud. We have significant data center and internet connectivity costs, especially with the storage, hosting storage. And we have, um, of course, we have licensing costs, one of them to OpenE. And uh, if you break this down, the infrastructure as a service is mostly the hardware, software, and licensing costs, whereas storage as a service, we have a significant internet traffic cost. And uh, some of that is hard to predict. And because every customer strategy is different, the exact cost is very difficult to determine. So Todd, we are two slides ahead now. We, I'm sorry, flip one slide forward, another slide forward, it should say, why is open e? I'm sure you love that slide, Todd. <laughs> Thanks, Black. Uh, yeah, I bring that up, Pete. Um, this is the, correct, this is the product slide we're on right now. Thanks, go ahead. By the way, there is one question somebody's asking right now. Oh, yes. Okay, are we got says, can I move, uh, I think they're dumping ahead, but that's okay, as a, can I move my legacy apps to the cloud? Is that a possibility? This might be a great question for Mark, uh, because my question to Janice would be, is that, are your legacy apps on a, on a SAN? Uh, are they hosted on a SAN, particularly a, you know, say your open eSAN, or is there any additional information that you can provide us? Okay, so Mark, yes, so Mark, can you explain um, perhaps the type, maybe the type of legacy application that can be hosted on in a WAN type setting? In other words, is, is the, the application and the data in the cloud or just the data? Is it a database intense application? Mark Brown? Essentially, the, um, they can both be in the cloud. Both the application and the data itself can be cloud. And you know, one of the great things about about the cloud environment is we can run any operating system we want, and so can you know we can intermingle operating systems. Let's say the application itself had to run on uh, an older operating system like Windows 2000 or even Windows 2003 server. Um, we could run that, but at the same time, if the database could be upgraded, and we wanted to run it on uh, MS SQL 2008R2 64-bit. Uh, you could share that as well. So that's one of the advantages uh, of being in the cloud is that you can run your older legacy apps on older operating systems or newer operating systems. It doesn't matter. Does that answer your question, Janice? Does that answer your question, Janice? I think it answered Jan's Thank you, Mark. question. Thanks, Mark. Okay, mm -hmm. Mike, so Todd, you've got the slide up. Yes, thank you, Todd. You've got the slide up here of why is OpenE DSS v6 best suited for the cloud storage. And the the, uh, the issue here is um, the issue here is pretty simple, actually. Um, as a customer, you have several choices for online storage. A couple of weeks ago, Amazon announced a service providing storage, presenting storage as an iSCSI target, for, for, for uh, perhaps a SAN target. The price is very similar to ours and other providers that I've seen, but the advantage to, to running OpenE, the DSS v6 itself, as a virtual machine in the cloud for you as an OpenE customer is the bells and whistles that you are going to be able to interface between your local SAN and the DSS in the cloud. So you have more options of how to, to tune that cloud-based SAN. 
efficient use of bandwidth, say through compression and synchronous replication, for example, specific to the DSS v6. And also because of the DSS v6 web interface that you might already be used to, you can easily tell if the replicated data, the data in the cloud is good or not, if it's uh, valid. Or if, um, if you had an issue, it, would it be uh, ready for a failover? So the next, the next slide, Todd, if you're ready for that, do we have any questions on this slide? Uh, looks like correct right now, there's uh, no questions. So we'll go to the next slide. Thank you, Todd. So when you have a dedicated, say you have a dedicated SAN in a, in a data center, you have higher costs due to just the buying the equipment, keeping the equipment up to date, uh, whatever redundancy level you wish to achieve, you have those costs. And frankly, it can be just a hassle. Whereas in the virtualized world, in the virtual world, we have clusters running where we host products such as DSS v6. There's already redundancy built in. By the way, we have built those uh, clusters. And there's no capital outlay for you uh, having to buy hardware. It's a monthly cost, or as we say, pay as you go, pay as you use. And upgrading for you, upgrading the storage capacity or upgrading any other type of uh, setup that we have is, is really just a, a kind of a upgrade on the fly, and you're ready to go. So you can literally upgrade, add, add storage volumes, upgrade storage on the fly, which is significantly more convenient than, of course, having to buy and host your own equipment. There's been some questions about, you know, the, the cost associated with this, and a lot of people do. They think, well, you know, having my own control of my own servers is something that uh, I want to in-house a lot. I don't think they realize that there is a lot of cost. Uh, we, we do get a lot of customers that are looking at, you know, well, if I house it, then there's power consumption. There's administrative work here that has to be done. But I think you, you bring a, a point about when you dedicate versus virtualize, um, you have to look at the cost. And, and overall, I even know that in some counties and states, that discounts on um, energy bills if they do more virtualization. Uh, have you heard about that? Mark. Mark, are you familiar with that? Where if you're putting in place where if you, let's say you have uh, many of the servers that a lot of the energy com com companies that basically are your power companies that give you a certain discount by doing a lot of virtual There wouldn't. I mean, I can. Speak, I don't know specifically, Todd, about you know certain counties in California. We may have tax credits available. I don't specifically know how they determine what percentage of our infrastructure is virtualized. But being green is uh, it, it's more. Um, it, it's not a straight line. You get it. You get an added benefit as you become more green, and virtualization certainly allows us to do that. It, it kind of goes back to the initial, you know, the initial uh, definition of virtualization, not related to say, as I defined it, as infrastructure or storage as a service, but virtualization itself is to allow a company to uh, more efficiently and effectively use all of the equipment that they have. So you don't have servers sitting around run, running Janus's one legacy application. You can virtualize that. You can take a server, virtualize it, and run all of Janus's legacy apps. Is that in, does that help a little more? Yeah, yeah, it does. In fact, Janice just popped in another. She just answered another question. She goes, um, and we got another one. She definitely, you know, she's worried that the, you know the of how it affects the private cloud on her IT team. Um, and also, what are the tools to help manage these changes? I think obviously there's going to be more tools as we go forward. 
but uh, I think overall, I think yeah, I'm though that's a, that's a team. How does a private cloud? Yeah, well, Janice is asking a broad question, and um, the, it depends how you virtualize. You know, we use we use VMware and Citrix. Uh, we're we're looking into Microsoft's hypervisor. Each of these companies offers a, a you know many many tools to help manage changing from a dedicated server to a virtualized server environment. Greg is asking what what security measures we offer. That again has a lot of answers to it because we have we have issues with firewall. We have we have yesterday as uh, uh, Todd, you and I and your engineer spoke of VPN connectivity into a virtualized SAN. And we also have the ability with OpenE um, being one of, being very cognizant of security issues, Greg, you can pretty much lock down a, uh, a SAN, an OpenE SAN to, you know, to almost any level, uh, all the way to having private IP address, which would of course be the VPN solution. Um, I don't mean to just stop answering Janice's question, but they kind of all fall together in tools and, and as companies learn to operate within a virtualized uh, environment. Is this helpful? It looks like it is. Um, and Greg also answered yes yeah. for that, uh, that question. I think it's, there's going to be a lot right. of... And, you know, it, it is the major issue that is security, and it, it's many, many layers of security. And yesterday, Todd, I spoke client, an engineering firm who um, needed to have a 50 gigabyte database um, that was being read, uh, used by many of their offices around the world, virtualized. And we just pretty much had to sit down with their engineering team and go through many different scenarios. So it's not a, it's not an easy question to answer. It kind of depends upon how the company itself operates their security measures as well. You know, I mean, I, I wanted to question this. Yeah, I'm sure, like, there's really, it's, it's like when you set up a SAN environment, um, even if you have two of them uh, pretty much identical, they're going to be very different. And I think that's what you explained to, to us and before and, and a lot of your customers is that there, there's such a wide range of setup and usages. Uh, and, um, and effects to the to their industry, their, the, how their infrastructure is, and, and it, I'm sure you really can't really exactly map it out for everyone, and it's uh, not one rule applies to all. And I think that's what you were mentioning, and, and you're right. And the more I read into about cloud and how we're getting into it, there's many different setups that we're seeing. We we can Todd, you and I can work work together to put together a little. You know, white paper or whatever you want to call it of how open e, you know, how we can work together to to secure those uh, types of environments. Yeah, I think that um, would be a good idea. We can work on that. It'll be a good, uh, because, yeah, because we work. You know, I read all the time of how Amazon is secure or not secure. One else, we we should we should. That's an excellent question, Greg. It's it's pretty much half of everything. That we are about security. Okay, you want to go to the next slide? Well, if I could enter, if I sure. There you go. I, yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Todd. Yeah. Well, what what happens when a disaster occurs? And we, we I think I. You know, disaster can be fire, flood, terrorism, and employee mischief, all sorts of things. Total catastrophic failure at the customer site. We kind of lumped two things in together. But let's just say the customer SAN goes down and, um, and we have to recover, we have to recover data. Well, we don't, with it, with the uh, DSS v6, it's not necessarily just a data recovery. It's actually a, a, a data Failover. So, taking uh, looking at a scenario where a, a SAN goes down on the customer site, the 
And Todd, please fill in any additional details on this. I'm, I'm, I'm being brief here, but the administrator is notified by an email that the SAN has failed on the customer site. The administrator then makes the... This, this is correct. Well, there's, there's then, many different... Go ahead. Do you want me to go ahead and finish or just wait till you get done there? I'll just, I'll, so, Todd, if the administrator switches the user over to the virtual SAN and uh, gives us time to bring the customer SAN back online, and then you can discuss how the replication would, would occur to bring the local SAN back uh, online. Correct. Um, what's uh, basically the email notification is one of the things I was talking about in some of the West Special Radio Controller failure. Um, I see a lot of tickets that come in where I get engineers that said, how come I wasn't identified or how come I wasn't notified that something uh, went down? And basically, um, they don't set up the email alerting system within the RAID controller. Now, with the automatic failover that we have built in mechanisms that if the RAID controller is failing, let's say, on the source, um, then we send out an email and we set up the email alert system in the DSSV6. Um, another thing is that we work with the LSI RAID controllers and freeware, so you can receive emails if there is uh, issues with the failover. Uh, primary server is having, uh, let's say, two drives come failing on a RAID 6, uh, then it's automatically going to fail over. Uh, but we do send out the email alerts. Additionally, you can use um, the some MIB 2 compliances where we have SNMP version 2 and 3, so you can put up some other learning system as well. So just doing those things too, especially being alerted, especially for the failover condition that we have on those mechanisms, um, that will help administrators be able to get you to be notified in case of a disaster that does happen. Okay, we've got one more. We got some questions coming up. Um, what happens in the event of data corruption? That's a good one. We we do we have seen data corruption in many different areas. Uh, we had a call in fact today. Uh, the guy was replicating. He he had, um, I believe it was a, some RAID controller. I don't want to name the manufacturer, but he was, believe it or not, using uh, a caching method with the SSD. And even the controllers that when they replaced it still uh, issues. Well, thank God it was replicated and his data was able to uh, still be accessed because the secondary, what it will do is it will promote itself as the primary server, so all the data will continue to be written to the secondary system that acts as the active server. Excuse me. And so basically what happens is that the when they fail over condition, you're able to get your data. Well, let's say your data is now corrupted, and it's corrupted on the source server that was there. Um, you're going to have to, if it's totally a disaster, you're going to have to re-replicate back from the paired server that had the other data. So you can re-replicate back from the secondary data back onto the main source or your site A. Let's say site A was the one that went down and site B is still living. Then re-replicate your data back to site A from B. Anything else? Any other questions before we move forward? Here's another question coming up, Michael. Uh, and Mark, if you're replicating, can you do a DR test on the replicated data? So uh, near to asking, can you do a disaster recovery test on the replicated? Replicate. Um, I would assume you could because if you're, let's say, let's say the Site A is your primary site. Um, if you were to lose site A and site B has your data, site A goes down, B is now active. Let's say you totally lose your uh, site A, and then you've got a remote site, and we'll call that site B, in for placement of site A. Well, you, what you do is you'll be able to stop the tasks 
uh, you'd have to realign the IP addresses for that same IP unless you have the same VPN connection and they have the same IP addresses. But you could do a pre-setup where they were, um, when you switch over, that uh, you can set up a new task, rerun the replication, restart the replication, and replicate your data back over to the new site, Site C. Okay, um, Mark or Mike, you got where to go to the next slide? Uh, I'm ready. Okay, I'm going to flip it over to the next slide. Yes, we're ready. Now, the reason why we did this slide was that I asked uh, Michael and Mark um, about, you know, can you give me some typical environments that uh, are set up with the cloud with what your customers are? You know, he really couldn't tell it because there's so many different ways. And with that, I'm not going to steal Mark uh, Michael's thunder here. So I'm going to let Michael uh, take over <laughs> and explain that one because it was a big question. Uh, um, and, you know, I think you can give some better examples of when we set this up and different types of scenarios. But we kind of just did a general overview. Go ahead, Mike. Oh, I was afraid you were going to do that to me, Todd. We, we basically treat... Um, we try to set up the virtualized, and by the way, Mark, Mark is here when he tries to, to talk. It doesn't, uh, he, he, um, gets muted or something. But, uh, there's so many different ways that we can set up the DSS in the cloud. Um, the, the, the way that we have it pictured here is that, as though it, it is as though it is on the same LAN, but over the WAN. So we have the security issues, that um, that uh, who asked that question? Greg asked earlier to con fifty percent of the battle, and um, Nir has another question for us. And then it's how how we set up the uh, IP addresses is a huge thing. Todd, you and I were talking about all the different ways yesterday, and I said, look, Todd, just take the IP addresses out of this because there's too many different ways to set it up. But basically, if you want to look at it in the simplest way. The, the IP address that the servers are reading from on the LAN side of the SAN, whether they are single, bonded, multiple, or whatever, that IP address has to be visible to the system, the local LAN uh, uh, side SAN fails, or even for the tests that I that, was uh, asking about uh, earlier. Earlier, there's other issues of just the way OpenE operates, which is the heartbeat or the uh, the ping node that uh, OpenE uh, operate. Um, is it Todd? Is it testing the replication of the data, or is it just the, the heartbeat is there to to um, manage yeah. the replication? Yeah, basically. Right, and then, uh, however, yeah, you and, and then, however, the you ch pl please jump in. Right, so the, the heartbeat between the two, so what we have is, and that, that's associated with the ping node. Uh, normally, you would see up here on the diagram, uh, what is a ping node in an auxiliary port? Uh, the ping node is important because it, it, they're both established. People, the, the DSSs have a ping node that we place in there. They're basically not you want. We both can see that IP address that we know they're going to be up. Um, so you are going to need to be able to uh, allow if the routers there set ICMP packages. But really what you want is, in this case, set up the VPN connection for best for security. So you're, you set up your, in the DSS auto failover service, you're going to be using the ping node and then, of course, the auxiliary port connection, where you see here it can be associated with the heartbeat for the client storage and the volume replication. You can lose a ping node. And let's say the ping node is the router or something that has 99.99% uptime. Of course, you want to get as many nines as possible, uh, like a UPS, a firewall, uh, a switch, something that's always going to be uptime. So you want to make a ping node that. And, of course, your auxiliary port is your volume replication client. But if you lose a ping node, you won't be failing over. It won't, it won't fail over. The only way you will be able to fail over is, let's say, the ping node and the auxiliary port connections 
uh, are disconnected somehow. What's going to happen is, is that the other replicated server, if it's going to be the primary that loses its ping node and auxiliary port connection, then the secondary is going to say, okay, I didn't get a response from him, and we're talking like microseconds, and I'm going to promote myself as uh, the active server, and at that point it takes over. Todd, um, can you answer the question that Nir is asking about resyncing the data from an alternative source, such as a, another drive or tape? Yeah, that's going to be you. That's going to be really difficult. If well, not necessarily. There are some ideas to do that. In fact, there is a product out there that's really useful. It's called VM Protect Six, and I'll type that in. He's doing a, another webinar on this. It's with Acronis. Um, in that, we have set up and tested it, and it's pretty much demonstrating that in the in the next. Uh, I think in about two weeks, we're going to be showing that. Uh, I'm going to type that in. Again, it's from VM, uh, I'm sorry, Acronis. And it's called VM Protect. And version 6 is the current version right now. We saw how this worked where we were able to take um, uh, virtual machines and back them up. Uh, and then we were able to store them uh, anywhere from NAS uh, or uh, a target. Let's say from if you say a Windows 2008 server running uh, this vSurf client side to connect to your virtual machine. Um, what it did, it, it did very fast and very clean, is that it replicated, it not, not replicated, but basically you replicate. Uh, so that it takes the whole image and then it, you can store it on, let's say, a NAS share, and then you can replicate that to, let's say, another site and restore that back on. Um, and what's really unique about it is that it can restore it uh, onto a ris a, the original, uh, where the original virtual machine is, or it'll create a new one. So it's very unique in what it does. And it's very inexpensive. I think it's under $700. And uh, so it works for uh, VMware 4.0, 4.1, and 5.0. So you can restore it. Uh, we, DSS does not currently have the ability to um, Backup from tape from a block device such as Fiber Channel or iSCSI. We are working on that for this probably later on in this feature this year. But you do have the ability to store your virtual machines or back up your virtual machines using the VM Protect uh, via Cronus, and that way you can store it on a NAS share. And from the NAS share, then you can go ahead and use the built in backup functionality that's in with DSS. And you can use backup to a tape, tape library, and you can back up to what's called a dynamic unit, um, which could be a USB, it could be a RAID volume, a RAID 10. I have many customers that say, what is the fastest way to back it up? I want to back up the tape. And I said, well, what happens if I can get you away from tape? What happens if I can take a RAID controller, fill the RAN uh, with SAS drives, and I can create a dynamic unit with the DSSV6 and put that on the RAID controller, and we'll virtualize that volume as a tape library. Now, that is fast, uh, much faster than the tape. So, uh, and you can even use an iSCSI target or even a fiber channel target and convert that into a dynamic unit and uh, virtualize that as a tape uh, library system for backing up all your NAS as you see. Um, here's another question. Can I determine where my data is stored? Uh, location can affect regulatory policies. Mike, did you see, yes, Michael, did you Todd, see you finally, finally have a question I can answer. <laughs> I, uh, was, I was just going to say, just on a very simplistic, think of a, think of a virtual SAN as, a, as, a, as a, an iSCSI target or a share presented to you, and there's so many different ways to handle that share, and it all goes back to Greg's question about security. And every day we make discoveries and changes to that. Um, but as far as the question of, again, Greg, where the data is stored, in our case, we know where, we can tell you where it's stored. Our data center is in El Segundo, California, with a 
point of presence at One Wilshire, the One Wilshire building in downtown LA. We have um, other contacts around the country, but we always know where the virtual machines are. Um, most of my most of my competitors are that way. I'm not sure about some of the very very large ones, such as Amazon and um, Rackspace. Huh? Go ahead, Todd. No, no, uh, say, say that again. Uh, we lost a little connection there. Concerning Rackspace? Oh, you lost me? Yeah, the answer to Greg's question is yes. We know where the virtual storage machines are. That can virtual Rackspace for the uh, virtual machines. Uh, looks like Greg said, okay, he got, got it. He understood on that one. Yeah. So, Michael, if you could go ahead with that. I, I didn't get that last piece. Oh, I think I'm done. I'm not sure you hear me. I just uh, I just was saying and some most of my competitors are that way. Um, like we're having some, uh, Mark would agree with that. Um, we'll the very, very we'll large ahead. ones, you know, that's Michael, an issue they have to there, deal with, ahead, Amazon and some in others. And uh, Mark as well. Uh, you can join on that one. If not, what we'll do is we'll basically go to the last slide that's coming up. And uh, I think we lost Michael McDonald one more time. So bear with me, everybody. Go ahead, Michael. Go ahead and test it now. Okay, Todd. This is a this is a seventeenth sound check. Uh, so we'll see if we get <laughs> I think if you can hear me it's out here. In, if we can hear me out here in Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can hear you now. Thank you, Todd. So let's go ahead with the next slide. I think we left this one up for, for Michael at the, for the end here because this one we wanted to throw some kind of interesting topic on this. Uh, Michael, I'll let you take it over. <laughs> Todd, I, I wasn't certain. That, I wasn't, I'm not really certain. What the topic is, my, just on a serious note, my, my, I'm not seeing the last slide, but if I trail motion, I've just trailed off. But the serious uh, topic here is all of these, uh, all of these online storage companies offering. Who, who knows what this for storage? And we're not sure what the long-term model is for them as far as when they run out of first-run, second-run finance whatever so just pay attention to who your, your your virtual provider is the storage provider what what equipment do they use where are they who are they can you talk to them have they been around for a while what technologies are they using spoke to dozens of companies before really gravitating toward open e because of the quality of the product and the ability for me to speak to engineers when I need to about how to do certain things for say Greg's security issues or Janice's legacy apps, and uh, I feel very strongly that uh, you know that together we can overcome most of the issues that come up with this relatively new new territory, which is virtualizing storage in the cloud. You know, it's true. I, I, I saw a lot of articles. We have some articles even on our um, on our website, uh, and I could bring those up where they're located. Uh, in fact, I will just do this real quickly and then um, see if I can bring this up for everybody. Uh, you're going to see your screen pop up. Let me just give me a second to load it up so everybody can go to the website at uh, OpenE. Uh, but I wanted to point out that um, when researching this, we did find out that there were a lot of companies uh, that did go under and didn't have experience of the issues with the uh, there, there's more like the, the cartoon pointed out. They went out of business, um, or they didn't have enough proper funding. Uh, they painted themselves, or they just ran out. Ultimately, what happens is, what are you going to do with your data? Uh, what you've already settled in, you put a lot of effort, you lost a lot. Of, um, now, who do you run to? Who do you go to? You see things like Amazon. There is a plethora of information on. Uh, Google when you ask about or about your cloud storage or 
you want to know a little bit more, you can click right here at Gimini Storage. If you go right to Solutions, and then from Solutions, you'll see uh, Business Solutions, and you'll see Cloud Storage, and we have a section for uh, DSS v6 is software for a cloud storage. Um, how to serve thousands of uh, users simultaneously under the cloud storage uh, topic that we have here. And of course, solution uh, for cloud. <laughs> so, you know, you might want to take advantage of this and also do some research. You can also contact us and they'll be happy to ask and uh, answer any of your questions. And that's why we wanted to basically bring this up uh, on the case of the last cartoon that we're showing here. So I think that uh, was really the interesting part of it all. Um, well, I think that's pretty much pretty much all that I have on this. And Michael, has come to add any last note before we session. I do want to thank you again uh, for, for both of you to show up. And with that, I'll let you, Michael, have the last comment. Hey, th thank you very much, Todd, for putting this together. And uh, I know uh, we've all had lots of good, healthy discussions about this uh, subject. I'm happy to uh, talk to anybody <coughs> offline. I think you put my website address on the uh, on the presentation. I appreciate everyone who's today and, bear and has uh, gotten through our sound checks. Thank you all. Thanks, Michael. Uh, we do have one last question, and I'll answer it, and then we'll close out the session. Anyone else to ask a question? Please do. Uh, it says, can you install OCD? I can, I, on I can answer it. Um, oh, I was dying to answer that, but please, Mark, go ahead. Uh, you know, yes, you can. Um, actually, one of the other things that AAA does is, is virtual private servers, and I'll we run uh, Zen Server and well, Citrix Zen Server and and then the Linux version of Zen Server and in both of those environments we use OpenE. Um, it's proven to be a very very stable product. Um, we have had some very minor issues with it, nothing serious and nothing that we haven't been able to recover from very very quick uh, quickly. And um, we've quite frankly never lost any data. Uh, never had any issues with data corruption in those environments running OpenE. So, yeah, Mark, uh, the how about the Zen Server tools? Can you install the Zen Server tools on the in the OpenE uh, virtual machine? Well, well, I'm for a little bit of clarification there. When you say you know, because Zen Server has two meanings. Are you referring to the Linux Zen server or Citrix Zen server? Citrix, yes, you can. Um, we run, we run. Uh, you know, for our people that work in house here, they are um, actually running Zen Center on a virtual server, um, so that they can they can uh, monitor and uh, and administer the, all of our Zen server. So yes, that's that's. That works quite well. Great. Welcome. Looks like you answered uh, all the questions. So I believe that the, the, there's no more questions. Uh, thank you for your patience. Profuse apologies. Um, I guess it, it happens to all of us. So this is the first time for me out of these many years doing these. Anyway, um, again, Michael, Mark, thank you very much. And uh, I think we might want to do one of these again sometime in the future and maybe recap on it and hopefully get it a little smoother um, and be able to talk about it. I think we're going to see some more questions. We lost a lot of people during the first session around, so, so I think another session would be. Um, I want to thank you both. Uh, Michael, take care. Mark, and thank you, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.